Hey, we are stepping back into the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. That's where we're gonna be tonight. Uh, man, before we get going, I wanna tell you just a couple quick stories um, of uh, some folly that I think are helpful for us tonight. Uh, one uh, man that I know, uh, when I was young, we were having a, a camp out, and uh, this was just a bunch of us, uh, the young guys in the church, and we were having this camp out, and uh, we decided that we were going to um, play, um, you know, play capture the flag, and we're playing capture the flag, we're running around, and there's always that one guy who's just like really macho, right, like a little too macho, and he's like, I, I'm just going to take my shirt off right now. I need to, like, that's going to help him, you know, uh, take, capture the flag better. So he pulls his shirt off. He puts it down. So we're playing. And mind you, at this time, I'm pretty young. I'm like eight years old, but I know something's weird <laughs> is going on. And this guy, he puts his uh, shirt down. And later, he goes to pick it up. And he realizes he had set it on an ant pile. And it was full of ants. But remember who this guy is. This is a macho guy, right? And so what does he say? Oh, I don't care. It's fine. And puts it on, right? Puts, puts his shirt on. Same guy, different time. Decides, and as soon as I say this, there's probably a couple people going to know exactly who this is. <laughs> Decides uh, because his motorcycle is dead and he needs to jump start it, right? I think the front row just figured out who it is. Uh, he needs to jumpstart his motorcycle. So what does he decide to do? He doesn't um, try to push it. He doesn't get it going down a hill. Um, he doesn't, at least if you're gonna tie your bike to something, like tie the bike to it, he gets his wife and she's in the car and he ties a rope, not around the bike, around his waist and then proceeds to tell his wife to punch it and she drags him for a while before stopping. Another instance, a lady who was in the church who's gonna rename nameless, uh, was after church with a group of people downtown and they were having lunch downtown and she decides to leave the parking lot but you know how some parking lots have those spike strips and you can only go one way. And she decides, no, I'm going this way. And everybody tells her, like, no, like, don't go that way. Stop. Don't, you're going to blow your tires. And she blows her front tires on that. And then out of just sheer stubbornness, says, oh, oh, well, I'm just going to do the back ones too. And goes right over it, right? Like, what goes on in the human head? And as I'm describing this, and as I'm thinking about this today, I'm probably not just describing an event that happened years ago. I'm probably describing how sometimes we live in our lives. How we know that this is not the way to go and this is not what I should do. And people are even trying to warn us and saying, hey, like, you've got to stop. Don't go another step. Like, stop. Don't go this way. And we're like, no, 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 I got it. And then bam, bam, blowing the tires out on our whole lives, right? Like, we've been there at that place where we're just like, no, you know, I don't normally do this, but I'm just gonna go this way. It feels right. It feels good for me right now. I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. And then we end up just blowing the whole entire thing. And here's the deal. Chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes is extremely practical. And we're gonna get some practical things tonight. They sound disjointed and they sound like they're not connected, but what he's going to do is he's going to describe the contrast between folly and wisdom. And there's a theme that's not separated from everything we've been going through from chapter one. But if we will let Solomon's ancient wisdom from years ago, if we will let it, I think it could just say to us, hey, the road you're on right now and the road you're going down is wrong. You need to stop. You need to just not take one more step. You're about to just blow out your tires right now. You need to just stop, hold on. If we will let it, the word of God does that for us. 
If we will let it penetrate, if we will listen to it, and I think that's what's happening in this chapter because we're gonna hear a little bit about folly and we're gonna hear about wisdom and I'm gonna ask some questions. I wanna do it a little different tonight. I'm just gonna ask a, uh, some questions and we're gonna kind of go through the text and we're going to ask ourselves some questions uh, that, kind of, um, that kind of help us reflect and see if we're living a life of folly or a life of wisdom. And then it'll show us also about really the pain in our life, where it's coming from, because there's different kinds of pain. There's pain that is unavoidable. And I think all of us at some point in our life have felt unavoidable pain. We felt pain that happens not because of something we did, but it's just this pain that sometimes happens because of life's circumstances and the seasons of life. Because we live in a broken and a busted up and a fallen world, all of us at time will have unavoidable pain. But there's also unnecessary pain. There's pain that if we would heed the words of the Lord and if we would heed the words and the ways of wisdom that we could perhaps not go down that road and blow out our tires or perhaps not put that shirt on with ants all over it, right? If we will listen to, to the word of the Lord. So if you would, we're going to look at uh, this chapter 10. We're gonna look at this first verse. I'm gonna read this. It says, Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. So there's two parts of this verse, and the first verse makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? So if you have something, a, a cologne that is just, just amazing, and it smell, it's a Tom Ford. It's like you paid like $300 for this cologne. Like hopefully none of us in here have done that, right? Maybe like a Burberry. Like if we have a Burberry or something that's good. But if a dead fly is in there or dead flies end up inside that perfume or that ointment, it's gonna pretty soon not be worth anything, is it? Pretty soon it's gonna start smelling. Pretty soon it's not something that we wanna put on at all. And what he's getting at is something that can be just very small can, can really ruin a whole life of good. Something that can be just bad for a moment. So here's the question that I wanna ask. Um, are we paying attention to the details? Are you paying attention to the details in your life? Now, there's a second part of this verse. If you can go back to verse one, verse one is saying, so dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor, which is surprising to me because wisdom and honor are valuable things. But he's saying just a little bit of folly. And, and the point that he's making here is folly is powerful. We can spend our whole lives building a reputation and one day it's gone. We can spend our whole lives building a business and one wrong decision, we've seen that time and time again where that business can collapse and fall apart. You can have the best marriage and the best relationship, but one moment of infidelity and the thing is over. So he's saying there's the, that folly can be a very powerful thing. Last week I was in Mexico with my friends and we ate soup, they served us soup almost every meal of the day. Not breakfast, but we had soup at lunch and we had soup at dinner. The next day at lunch and at dinner, at lunch and dinner, some of the most amazing soups I've ever had. There was chowders, there was the broccolis, there was corns, there was like, I, don't even, I can't even tell you what all these soups were, I have no idea what they were but they were really good and I don't even eat soup. But imagine you have soup and it's a big bowl of soup and you are stirring around in there and you see a cockroach, right? We wouldn't just say like, it's not that big. It's just, just a little one, right? I'll eat around it. That whole soup, we're gonna push that away, right? We're not gonna eat it. And the same thing with, with folly, and this is, what, this is the point he's getting at, is a little bit of, of bad, a little bit of folly can ruin so much honor. 
And so much value and so much virtue can just be out the window when you have folly in your life. And what is that folly? It's like living this life, and he's been referring to this life under the sun, this life on earth apart from God, living this life that is is pushed away from wisdom and a life that is lived selfishly and foolishly. Imagine if you had a balancing scale. We've all seen balancing scales. And you would put like honor and like virtue and all these things on it and it could just, it would just go down. It's like these, these really heavy, weighty things, but just a little bit of folly and it just outweighs it. It just outweighs it. So I think he's asking us this question, are you paying attention to the small things? In, are you sweating the small things? Are you, are you sweating the details because we need to? Like we've heard this before over and over again. Don't sweat the small stuff. Solomon, the wisest person that has ever lived, the most wealthy person who's ever lived, is saying, no, 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 that's the way of the world. Sweat the small stuff. There's a, a really interesting thing, this quote, that has to do with a horse uh, shoe nail, and I want to read that for you. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the battle was lost. For the failure of battle, the kingdom was lost. All for the want of a horseshoe nail. Do you get that? Are you you seeing that? Like little cracks in our integrity, little cracks in our lives, Little cracks in our spirituality. Just, man, when we say, oh, just, just a little bit. I'm just gonna do this for just a little bit. Nobody's even gonna know. I don't normally do this, but I'm just gonna, just for a little bit, you know. Have you ever heard the phrase, like, uh, small holes sink big ships? They do. It can be just something so little, but when it's just a little drip and a little drip and a little drip, a little drip can lead us to a place in our lives where we look back and we say, man, how on earth did I get here? Most of the time when we end up in those places where we look back and we say, how did I get here? It's not because we got there overnight. It's because we had this slow, long, gravitational pull towards something. And it started small and it started minute. It started innocent, and it slowly, slowly, slowly worked that way. There's a play kind of off that horseshoe in the nail poem, and it's actually about Jesus, and I want to read that. It says, for want of abstaining from a crust of bread, a fast would be lost. It's talking about Jesus in the wilderness. For want of a fast, a prayer would be lost. For want of a prayer, a vision would be lost. For want of of a vision, a mission would be lost. For want of a mission, a sacrifice would be lost. For want of a sacrifice, an eternal kingdom would be lost. Aren't you glad that Jesus paid attention to even the small and the detailed things in his life? As he walked through this earth that he paid attention and he didn't just say like, oh, just a little bit, it's all right. So verse two goes on. And verse two is gonna say this, it's gonna say, it's gonna turn and it's not just about um, this, this metaphor of a flying ointment, but he's gonna make something very practical and he's gonna to point to our hearts. A wise man's heart inclines him to the, which way? But a fool's heart to the? So what this is, is this, I think there's a copying and a pasting thing going on here. But uh, a wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. What it's telling us is this, that left-handed people, you need to watch out for them, okay? (laughs) No, pastor's left-handed. My sister's left-handed. And so we're gonna pray for them at the end of the night. We're gonna pray for healing for them. Amen. How many left-handed people we have in here? Okay, that's why the laugh wasn't that good, right? <laughs> you guys are like, I'm gonna get him. So there's, uh, through scripture, there's this idea of the right being um, of honor 
and the left being of dishonor or the right being of strength and the left uh, being of weakness. So you'll see through scripture, sometimes blessings are given. Uh, blessings are given with the right hand. You'll see Jesus, um, we see that he is seated at the what hand of the father? The right hand of the father. Uh, we see that in Revelation, we've got this picture of, um, of the, this um, really this chasm being made and separation and distinction between uh, the, who, those who are righteous and those who are unrighteous. Um, and the, the, the metaphor is used of sheep and goat and the goats are gonna be moved to the, and the, the left-handed people are like, no. Uh, the goats are gonna be moved to the left and the sheep are gonna be moved to the right. And so he's making, kind of using that same language here. He's using that same uh, kind of information here saying that, you know what? Um, that the, the heart of a man, um, it moves us in different directions. And I think what he's also talking about here is just our ability um, to follow our heart instead of true wisdom. And for us, that's gonna be the Holy Spirit. It's gonna be the word of God. It's gonna be um, godly counsel and not just our heart. Because so many times we can just go right after the heart and say, man, I just, you know, the heart wants what the heart wants. How many guys have ever said that? Like, man, I just feel like this is what I need to do, right? There's a quote I wanna look at. It says this, right and left are natural symbols for the strong and good on the one hand and for weak and bad on the other. And look at this. I think this is really important for left-handed people. Uh, the Latin word for sinister means left. And so I just wanted to bring that up again. Our pastor is left-handed. The heart, um, as we look through scripture and ancient literature, the heart, we think of it as a, a mainly an emotional thing. And this is a lot bigger definition. When you look at um, scripture throughout as a whole, uh, specifically the, the Old Testament, what you're gonna see is that it's, it's encompassing of not just emotion, but of your mind and of your thought of your will, and it was a lot bigger definition. And so uh, when we read through uh, scripture, we have to keep that in mind. Um, and when we get to our culture and our modern era that has heart as an emotion, we need to kind of register that a little bit when people are telling us to follow your heart. How many have heard people say that? Just follow your heart. Yeah. Well, what's your heart tell you to do? But you know what? Our hearts are sometimes just so far off base. And I would tell you this, don't trust your heart, especially if it's not surrendered to the Lord. So here's the other question, is your heart surrendered to the Lord? Is your heart surrendered to the Lord? So like, are you mindful of the details of the small things that, that work their way into your life and, and it, are you surrendered, is your heart surrendered to the Lord? Because we can't trust our heart and specifically when it's not surrendered to the Lord. Jeremiah says this, and I think it's the most popular verse when it comes to the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, or your version might say wicked. Who can understand it? So is Jeremiah telling us like, hey, just follow your heart? Is, is this a scripture? This is the word of the Lord. Is it telling you just like, hey, you know, just uh, the heart wants what the heart wants. Is it telling us that or is it telling us to be on guard against your heart because it will trick you? Because it's the heart, it's that, that, that emotional center in you that's gonna tell you, you know what, you're angry right now and you need to send that text. Even though it's one in the morning, you need to send that text. That's what your heart's gonna tell you to do. Your heart's gonna tell you, you know what, you need to tell that person how you really feel. Like even though like it's gonna be pretty rough on them and it's gonna be mean and you're gonna use some cuss words, you just gotta go for it. This is your truth. That's what the heart tells us to do. 
The heart tells us like, you know what? I can't afford this right now. Like I don't have the money and I'm gonna go in a lot of debt, but man, I just, oh, my heart wants it. The heart will, will tell us like, man, you know what? This relationship is toxic and I need to get out of it, but man, it just, I just feel so good when I'm with the person. I know they don't like me or how I look. They don't like how I talk. And they always tell me that over and over. But, I, but maybe I should stay here in this. That's what the heart tells us to do. And here's the deal. We have to have a heart that is surrendered to the Lord, not just a heart that is surrendered to our wants. There's no hybrid Christianity. And it's not... There's no Christianity light. Have you got an app before and there's like the real app that you have to pay for and then the light app? There's not like a Christianity light or a, a hybrid Christianity where you get to just, you know, do what you want and not surrender your heart to the Lord. Either we're surrendered to him or we're not surrendered to him. And scripture is, is calling us and Ecclesiastes is saying, be mindful, be on guard against your heart because it can lead you to a life of folly. Galatians says this, I have been, what is that word? Crucified with Christ. I have been crucified. My heart, my life, my will, my mind, everything has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We have to live lives that, that are surrendered to God, amen? Here's the other thing. Are you listening to godly counsel? Are you listening to godly counsel? In this room, we have a faith family. And God, it, at times, because he's done this for me and in my life, and I know it's gonna be true for you too, that he speaks to us through the people in our faith family. Are you listening to the people that God has put in your life? Look at uh, verse three of chapter 10 with me. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense and he says to everyone that he is a fool. So it's very obvious. It's saying like everybody knows it, everybody sees it, everybody is aware of it. How many of you guys have, have seen somebody who's been in a relationship or maybe you were the person in the relationship? And then the relationship ends, and usually badly, and everybody's like, we all thought, like, why are you in that relationship? It was obvious. Like, what were you doing in that relationship? Why were you dating that person? Why were you, like, why were you going down that road? And then we always say to them, like, well, why didn't you tell me? Like, why didn't you tell me? And usually the response to that is, is one, like, it's so obvious. Why would we need to tell you that? And then two, the response it's usually like, we did tell you, you just ignored us. God puts people into our lives to speak to us and to help us, to grow us. This kind of merges into the next couple of verses. I wanna look at verse, uh, the next verse, verse um, eight and nine, that says this. He says, he who digs a pit, and this seems real random here. He who digs a pit will fall into it and a, a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stone is hurt by them and he who splits logs are endangered by them. Now, there's a couple ways of looking at this. The more general consensus is this, that when he's talking about a person who's digging a pit and falling into it, there's a reference throughout scripture of people falling into a pit. And usually it's around people who are being stubborn or people who are intentionally going down a road that they should not be going down. And I think that's what we do a lot of times with sin. And, and we're gonna use that a little bit interchangeably, sin and folly, we're gonna... You see in the last chapter, in chapter nine, that Solomon does that too. He's talking about sin, he's talking about folly, and some of that is really interchangeable here. But sometimes we get hurt, and we just go all out in the wrong direction because we're hurt. Because maybe our heart's broken, or maybe somebody said something to us at church, and you know what, I'm just gonna say, forget church, forget God, I'm gonna just go this way 100 miles an hour. How many of you know somebody who's done that? Who's had just hurt or frustration 
or who has just felt wronged maybe in the church and they have said, man, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be on a mission to just sin in my life and I'm gonna go the opposite way and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do this and nobody can say anything to me and just blow everything off. I don't think that's everybody here, but I think it's some of us that are here. And I I wanna remind you that when we do yield to the spirit of God and allow Jesus to work in our hearts, he, he provides healing. And maybe you're here and you have gone down this road of really having resistance to the spirit of God and resistance to his voice calling you back home. And I just want to say you're in the right place. But be open to the voice and be open to the healing of the Holy Spirit. We can take that hurt and we can take that frustration and take that brokenness and mend it. It's an awesome thing when you find healing, isn't it? When you've been broken for a long time, when you've been hurting for a long time and you find healing You know, most of the time when I see that in church, I see it um, in kind of like mentoring applications where it's not just one person in isolation, but it's multiple people or a person that connects with other people and God begins to do a work in their life through other people. I think that's um, just so important for us to seek godly counsel. And most of the time what that's gonna look like for us is finding somebody that's older than you. I don't know why it works out that way, but most of the time it's finding somebody who has gone down and lived a little bit longer life than you have, who's had a little bit more experience than you have, that has a little bit more wisdom than you have. And maybe don't just sit down with those people and if you're here and you're just needing wisdom in your life, Man, we've got some amazing godly people in this church that would love to just meet with you, sit down with you, hang out with you, and you can ask them any question that you want to ask them. You can ask them, like I ask people questions all the time. I'm not huge on small talk. I want to, I want to, I'll come with a list. You know, if you'll sit down with me, I'll have a list of questions to ask. So we need to seek godly counsel. Job 12, 12 says, wisdom is with the aged, amen, amen? All the young people are like, ah, I don't know. Wisdom is with the aged and understanding in length of days. Find people who are further along than you. I think that's one of the ways that we can avoid unnecessary pain in our lives. We've all heard that statement and it's kind of cliche, but like a wise man learns from his mistakes but a wiser man learns from the mistakes of others. And that's the beautiful thing about being in a faith family in a community like this is we can get together with other people. We can get together with other people that have gone down that road and we can find healing through their words. Verse 10, out of chapter 10, says, if the iron is blunt, and, the, and one does not sharpen the edge, he must see more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. Now, there's kind of two sides to this coin that I think are really uh, important to think about. Um, one is, man, chopping wood with a dull axe uh, is just, it's folly, isn't it? It's just, it takes more time and it takes more strength and it takes more energy So all of us need to be aware when we need to take some time back and let the Holy Spirit do a work to sharpen us. All of us need to be aware that we need to, at times, take a step back and let the Holy Spirit refresh us and renew us and we just wait on the Lord. Now, F.B. Myers says this, and I think this is a really cool quote. At all such times, let us turn to God and say, put in more strength. Let thy power be magnified in my weakness. 
Give more grace so that thy work shall not suffer. Surely more work is done by a blunt edge and divine power than by a sharp edge and little power. Now, what he's doing here is he's talking about sometimes we're dull because God is using us and we're being worn. And he's saying that's not a bad thing because a lot of us, we're like, man, if I'm worn out and I'm feeling dull, that's just a bad thing. And what he's saying here is realize this, is we're dull because of use. And when God is using us and God is using us and God is using us, don't always push away from that because that can be a time of growth where God is using us. But at the same time, just realize this, when you're in that moment, you can do more by a dull edge and divine power than a sharp edge, right? So what he's saying, he's saying this, like, man, make sure if you're dull that you're not just going around and saying like, man, I'm sharp and on it and I have wisdom, but no Holy Spirit. Make sure you have, if you are dull, you can get more done being dull with the Holy Spirit than sharp without the Holy Spirit. So I think that's like something really, really good to think about is realize the season of life that you're in. Realize if it's a time where God is saying, man, I'm using you, I'm wanting you to press in, I'm wanting you to go, and even though you are dull, my strength will be magnified in your weakness. And realize the times when he's calling you to step back and to be maybe silent for a while and to wait on him. Verses 12 through 14 are gonna kind of make a shift. So we've been talking about real practically some of the things that we do, our deeds, uh, our heart. We've been talking about um, our actions in, in some ways. And now he's gonna shift that because it's not just our ways, but it's also our words that can produce a lot of folly. Um, so we wanna ask this question, are you mindful of your words? Are you mindful of the things? Because here's the deal, folly shows up in the things you do, but you can see it really easy in the things that people say. Like in the way we talk, and the way we, we speak. So verses 12, 13, and 14. Uh, the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. This is somebody who's gonna talk and talk and talk and talk, and they don't even know what they're talking about. He's saying, don't be that person. How many in here are that person? No, how many people know somebody that looks like that, right? How many are sitting right? No, I'm kidding, don't say that. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness and the end of his talk is evil madness. So it's, it's like this, have you heard somebody that is talking and as they're going, it's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. It's starting at foolishness and it's, e it's ending at just pure evil. He's saying, don't be that person that just with your mouth, you are just tearing everything down. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him. The toil of a fool wearies him, uh, for he does not know the way to the city. Now, that for he does not know the way to the city is just this really simple thing. We should all know a way to a city. If like you're out in a region, you're gonna know the way to the city. And so he's saying, it's like, man, he, this person that is full of folly because they're running their mouth all the time and they're not mindful of their words doesn't even know how to do the simplest things. So there's this quote uh, that I wanna read again by Wright. He says uh, this up there, I think I have it, yes. Uh, in a fine note of sarcasm, this proverb says that a person may be so involved in arguing about the universe that he misses what the ordinary person is concerned about, namely finding the way home. We can be so caught up in other things that we can't even do the simplest, tiniest thing. And that's folly in our words and in our language. God has created us to encourage other people and to praise him and to worship him. Like that's what he has called us to do. And I feel like the, in, our, in our language and in our mouth and in our speech as a society, our conscience has been seared. I feel like even when you watch TV, there's words that you hear on TV that you would have never heard when I was a kid. You can't go anywhere without hearing language that is obscene nowadays. 
I went to, uh, uh, I can't say the place, I'm not gonna say the place, but I went to a place with my kid uh, a few months back and there was uh, an employee there that was just using foul language, R-rated language in front of my kid. And I tried to ignore it and I tried to just let it go and it just was bothering me. So I finally went and, and anyways, I can't go to that place anymore. But the kid, he, he apologized to my son. And I made him apologize to my son. And because, man, it just breaks my heart. I don't know if, you've, if you're noticing this, but man, the folly of our culture right now is seen so easily in the words that we say in the language in our speech. And it's inside the church too. It's not just them, it's us too. Like gossip can become so easy and so easy and so easy for us just to talk about people and not realize that we're actually gossiping or to bring somebody, tear somebody down or to try to you know, put somebody in their place and not encourage somebody at all. And I think we go down the same exact road Here's the whole deal with Ecclesiastes that I'm convicted by week after week after week after week because I look at this and I say, man, you're right, Solomon. People are idiots, you know? Same thing when I drive down the road and somebody goes this way and they're driving too fast and they're driving too slow and I'm like, idiots. Everybody's idiots, you know? Everybody but me. Right? And when we read Ecclesiastes, it's so easy to do that. You're right, Solomon. You're right. Everybody but me. Everybody but me. I think we have to take some responsibility for our words, responsibility for the surrender of our hearts, responsibility for getting godly counsel, responsibility for the small little details in our lives, responsibility for maturing as a Christian. Because God wants you to grow in your Christian life, in your Christian walk. He doesn't want you to stay where you're at. Are you maturing? Are you maturing? Are you growing? Are you closer to the Lord now than you were before? He ends this section in verses 16 and 17 with really a tale of two lands and two kings. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child. And it's not talking about somebody that's young. It's talking about somebody who's acting like a child with immaturity and irresponsibility. And he said, uh, woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your uh, prince uh, feast in the morning. Is that the time when you feast? No, he's not feasting because he's hungry. He's feasting because he's just wanting to appease himself. But in contrast to that, Happier you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility. So he's been taught the right ways generationally. And your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. He's pointing out something here too, is our folly doesn't just affect us. Our folly affects the people that are around us. And you can see that as he's talking about a leader or a king Happy are you when you have leadership who do the right thing. There's a quote I read this week that says uh, that God often punishes nations by giving them wicked leaders. And man, you can just look at some of the leadership in, the, in not just right now, but over a period of time. And I think we have to take personal responsibility for that and say, God, what are you trying to teach us? What are you saying to us? How are you pointing out the folly in my life and how can we turn that into a way of wisdom and walk in the way of wisdom? Would you guys stand together? God is good, amen? Amen. I'll tell you, uh, Ecclesiastes isn't a book that I think any person spends just a whole lot of time in, but to me, there's this pleasant surprise of, um, of how God is speaking to me about wisdom and folly and meaning and purpose and his desire to leave a legacy and to live a life that is, is worthy 
um, of all the good things that he's given us. God is good, amen. God is good, amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we just thank you right now. You are so good to us. You are far better to us than we have ever been to you. And we deserve, God, to be just, Lord, just to be so far from you, but you have chased us down, pursued us, brought us in, accepted us, unashamed of who we are and calling us by name. God, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, I pray tonight that you would help us to heed the words of wisdom, to heed the words of your word, to heed the words of your Holy Spirit, to reject just our emotions and our heart, but listen to your word, your spirit, and the godly people that you've placed around us. Help us to walk in wisdom, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen. amen.